welcome to uh, these development talks on uh, ICT. Uh, my name is Julia Scott. I will be your moderator for the day. Uh, and as I said, we have a packed schedule full uh, of interesting conversations. The way this is going to work is that uh, the panelists will give a brief presentation uh, one by one and then uh, join each other for uh, discussion. And we will have room for questions uh, from the internet, uh, but also feel free to tweet uh, comments and thoughts and do use the hashtag devtalks. Uh, I've, I'm going to get to do something now that I've always wanted to do because I've been told to tell you that the emergency exits are here. <laughs> um, uh, so I would like to welcome the Director General of SIDA, Charlot Piazzegonitska, to uh, welcome us uh, to this day. A round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Julia, and, and uh, it's my privilege to welcome you all to this very exciting uh, morning with this burning issue, I would say. Uh, you should know that more than 200 people have registered to be here today. About 150 of you are external distinguished guests which is a record for development talks. So we have already started on a good note. Uh, and we can by that conclude that th the topic is highly relevant and timely. So a warm welcome to you all. The same rights that people have offline must also be protected online. This is a phrase that I and Sida and we are keep, we, we have kept repeating it for, for long and it is somewhat clear to most of us, but time after time we still see that it's not something that we should take for granted. This is one of the reasons why one of Sida's focus areas this year is democracy and human rights, which is always a priority area for Sweden and SIDA. But this year, we have a special emphasis on freedom of expression and ICT. While the global and open nature of the internet is a massive driving force in accelerating progress towards development in its various forms, we have also learned that it is not as easy as it seems, or maybe as we thought. This issue is complex and need to be acknowledged by, by all of us and acknowledged as complex. And we need to be able to see both the possibilities and address the challenges at the same time. And this development talks on ICT and human rights uh, is here today to show us ways of how this can be done. Maybe one could argue that it was easier to take a clear stance on this topic in the past. Let us roll back the discussions for somewhat five years ago. What many of us back then uh, was, I mean, we, was a sup we had a super optimistic perspective on how the internet would liberate the unfree and bring prosperity to the developing parts of the world. The culmination of this era could have been what later was described or known as the Arab Spring. Many actors in the discussion argued that we only needed to bring more internet to the Facebook revolutions in order to get more democracy and freedoms. We, on the other hand, and a lot of you who have gathered here today, I'm sure, understood that there was no such easy answer. With the possibilities of ICT, there also came a lot of challenges. But as strong actors in development cooperation, we had then understood that it is most critical, most crucial for us uh, still to emphasize the positive forces on ICT. We, SIDA and others, have a long tradition of supporting actors working for free and diverse media landscapes. We were quite early in supporting digital, digital initiatives for human rights defenders. 
And we even did this in some of the world's most unfree states. We have supported educational and technical efforts to protect and empower those who need it the most. Many of the initiatives are targeting on bridging a range of digital divides, such as both when it comes to poverty, power and gender. But we were also eagerly listening when we got reports on how technologies were misused. We were worried when we learned how information and its freedom was attacked, filtered, censored and hindered in various ways. This needs to be tackled more efficiently than we do today. This duality was clear to us then, and it is still today. Whenever discussing ICTs and human rights, we always have begun with on one hand and on another. But we have been talking about this before. We have already identified many obstacles. We are, however, still looking for good solutions. And we want and we know that we could navigate these difficulties wisely uh, and lead us ahead towards a better world for all which is what this morning is about. Over the, couple, over the last couple of years, we have been approached by many actors in this field. Uh, we have a long tradition of working with human rights related civil society organizations. Many have adopted great skills in understanding how their work relates to a new digital society. But we are also active in partnerships and discuss discussions with a range of companies and corporate entities working in the field of ICT. Not the least in our industry network, uh, the Swedish Leadership for Sustainable Development. All involved parties working with us have been keen on us moving ahead uh, and to stop talk the talk and start to walk the walk. And this is a good thing, because we like doers. We like doers. Among the doers are the representatives of both civil society and ICT sector here today. We are happy to have representatives from Access Now, Privacy International and Civil Rights Defenders as panelists here today. And the know-how that you represent, how technology disseminates and affects people's situations on the ground, on the ground, which is so important, is, of course, of great essence. We are also very happy to have representatives from the Industry Dialogue and MTG here with us today. We firmly believe that your work is a very important base in the future societal development. With the added value of also having representatives from ranking digital rights and institution, institute of human rights and business with us here today, we are very happy to have the possibility to analyze the current events and happenings in a more systemic way, because we are actually here today, the actors that could really discuss this issue, not as an ad hoc issue, but in a more systemic way. So it is about time for more people, entities and movements, movements to step up and show courage enough to face the challenges in a progressive way. Some of you have already done this, I know, but many of you are involved in this serious struggle on your own. And this needs to change. This kind of groundwork based in solid human rights is something that needs to be done in a collaborative effort. The combination of our know-how in major processes, your different sorts of expertise, and the combined eagerness to make a change, we can truly lead the way. So let's use this opportunity to investigate the possibilities of establishing a more long-term strategic collaboration. Let's not only talk, let's share our thoughts and find ways to move ahead. So today, today 
we will discuss two major hot topics in the field of ICT and human rights. First, as said, there will be a panel, and that panel is going to focus on synergies between ICT, the ICT sector and the human rights defenders. How can we best use each other? We have, always, we have already identified that ICT, the telecom sector and the media sector, uh, as cr they are crucial in providing infrastructure and tools for development of societies and empowerment of people. But from time to another, we understand that uh, this is easy to, to say, as I just did it, just as, you know, we would take it for granted. But we know it is not as easy in reality as it is to say. Some of those who best understand the challenges of ICT implementations are the civil society. The civil society working with human rights defenders, learning about the necessity of open, free and secure ICT in the most obvious, devastating ways. If we agree on the basic fundamentals of democracy and human rights, we need to solve this. Hopefully we can today pinpoint some of these common issues and see how we could help each other in navigating this difficult terrain. We will also discuss the issue of transparency reporting. As uh, being great advocates of transparency and accountability SIDA is very happy to see the movement of more transparent operations in the field. As the world is constantly being even more connected, a lot of questioning eyes fall on those who act as they had something to hide. As big telecom operators start working on their openness, we and other actors can get involved in the central issues in a more informed way. Suddenly we get the possibility to understand what's going on. Getting an insight in the difficult circumstances under which some of our partner, some of our partner companies are working. I hope that today's ending session covering this topic of transparency will result in a greater understanding of both the overarching topic of transparency as such but also a more in-detail conversation on how this movement towards greater openness can be made the most of. CEDA has actually three words that guide us in our daily work since half a year back when we decided to embark on leading the change to eradicate poverty and working for human rights. We want to be open, brave and dedicated in everything we do. So we cannot work with you here today uh, not addressing uh, the issue of transparency, but also realizing that with openness comes challenges that we have to work with. ICTs are, wherever used for good, truly empowering. We need to address the difficult questions, but keep a clear perspective on the future as something positive. But this is something that you, we need to do together. This development talk is a part of an effort, not only today, but I'm truly happy to see you all here today and I know that you can move this issue forward today if I stop talking and you start to walk. Thank you very much and a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, I should say also that this event is being uh, streamed live and will be uh, saved later so that people who aren't here can see it later and so that you can watch it over and over and over again for inspiration when and if you need it. So our first panel uh, is under the title Human Rights in Focus, Using ICT to Defend Freedom. And to start, off to start us off, I would like to welcome Lucy Purden, Project Manager of ICT at the Institute of Human Rights and Business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so thank you to CEDA for inviting me to beautiful Stockholm, one of my favourite cities. I'm going to talk a little about the potentially positive impacts for human rights when ICT companies and NGOs find common ground. 
So I'm here from the Institute for Human Rights and Business in the UK. We're an international think and do tank. We work on the corporate responsibility to respect human rights as outlined in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. So I'd like to start the day by giving a positive example from our work, a study we're just embarking on regarding network disconnection in Pakistan, which we're working on in partnership with Telenor Pakistan, the NGO Bites for All, and the Centre for Human Rights and the Internet in Berlin. So one of the key challenges facing civil society today in holding governments to account is regarding the issue of national security and terrorism. And this is a common theme all over the world, which has been heightened since the Snowden revelations. And in many countries, governments often order telecommunication companies or telcos to shut down mobile and internet services. It is mostly used as a tool to break up protests, most famously seen during the Arab Spring in Egypt which has clear implications on the right to freedom of expression. But it still goes on in other countries, and perhaps it's easy to conclude that telcos should try and push back on these requests due to the clear impact on human rights. But in somewhere like Pakistan, where the security situation can be precarious, governments often order network shutdowns on the justification that they think a bomb is about to be detonated, and it will be detonated by a mobile phone. So in these situations, how is a telco supposed to make that judgment call can a telco realistically push back on such a request? But as more and more people be, are connected and rely on digital communications in their everyday life and work, the more dangerous network shutdowns potentially become. For example, during a shutdown, injured people are unable to call emergency services. Mobile money transfers, which millions of people depend on, stop during a shutdown. It can cause panic as people are unable to assure friends and relatives of their safety. It's critical, therefore, that alternatives to disconnection are explored. But the actual social and economic impact of a shutdown on society has not been fully explored or documented. So with our partners, we're producing a study that gathers evidence of impacts on health, education and work and present it to the government of Pakistan, opening a dialogue with business and civil society, the ultimate goal being that network shutdowns are reduced. So an ambitious plan. And so how to do this? Well, this is an example of where it is essential to have the cooperation and support of telcos. Telcos are the ones with the relationship with the government. An organisation like ours could not just go and knock on the door of the government and expect to be taken seriously and heard. Also essential is partnering with civil society on the ground. And a project like this could not and should not be done without the involvement of local groups. But there are a lot of differences between NGOs, methods and business practices which make it a challenge to bring companies and NGOs together. There are trust issues. When dealing with companies, you're often dealing with confidential information, and companies can be worried about information finding its way into the, into the media. Non-disclosure agreements may be involved to protect the company, and this often does not sit well with NGOs, whose aim is to encourage transparency. And another factor in working for an NGO is that things take time. Things do not move at the same pace as they do in the business world. And NGOs are often small with few resources and things do take time. And this can often be frustrating for business. And there are also funding issues. If an NGO works closely with a company, that raises questions about funding and where money is coming from. Companies may want to help, but taking company money can be awkward for an NGO. So there are gaps to bridge and bridges to build. But traditionally, companies and NGOs may be suspicious of each other but in this case that I've just presented, they actually have the same goal, and that's to reduce the frequency of network shutdowns. So when responsible business and NGOs find common ground, there is much potential to improve human rights. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Uh, next up is uh, Robert Hord, who is Executive Director at Civil Rights Defenders. Another round of applause. <coughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Sida, for uh, uh, inviting me to this really uh, interesting and, and uh, hopefully constructive uh, conference. And thank you, Sida, for all the, the years of uh, very uh, successful cooperation. We have achieved a lot of uh, great things together. Um, Civil Rights Defenders is an international human rights organization working to uh, defend people's civil and political rights and to empower human rights defenders at risk uh, in Sweden and internationally. Our headquarters in, uh, in are in Sweden, and uh, we have been in existing for more than 30 years. Uh, 
in 2007, I, I think I will start my story there. In 2007, I was sitting down uh, with some of our colleagues in Chechnya, in, in Grozny, uh, discussing about the work that we are doing uh, with bringing Russia to the European Court for Human Rights uh, for war crimes, uh, cases of tortures, uh, abductions, uh, uh, disappearances, etc. One of the persons that uh, were present at the meeting was uh, Natalia Estemirova, uh, one of the most famous uh, and courageous human rights defenders uh, in the region, but also the uh, entire Russia. Uh, I didn't know, of course, at the time that that was the last time I met with Natalia, because in 2009 uh, she was murdered. Uh, she was picked up, abducted from her home in the morning uh, in Chechnya and brought to the neighboring Republic of Ingushetia where she was uh, shot to death. Um, as a human rights organization, I, I think we reacted as any conventional human rights organization would do. Uh, we felt that we needed to do something, so we set together, together with other uh, human rights organizations, a conference. Gathering human rights defenders from Russia in Sweden, in Stockholm, and what we uh, then initiated and, and called as the Stockholm process. But we also brought in other international human rights organizations uh, in order to find practical solutions, almost like this, to discuss how could we what, ca what can we do to um, strengthen uh, the security of human rights defenders at risk? How can we also, because Sweden at the time was the chairman of the European Union, how could we... Um, um make a change in, in uh, bringing up the issue of human rights defenders in Russia to uh, the top summit uh, that uh, the EU had with Russia later that year. Uh, we arranged, the, the we continued to arrange the Stockholm process for a number of years, but it was really frustrating, to be honest. A lot of talk, as uh, Charlotte was discussing here earlier, a lot of talk, but not so much walk. Of course, we continued with the regular work that, that we always do, uh, but the killings uh, continued during the year, and uh, we felt that we needed to add something, something more to it. So what we did uh, was actually to look outside the famous box. We looked at the corporate world to see how would they go about uh, a problem like this. And we realized that uh, there is actually no one in the human rights, uh, uh, among our human rights organizations, colleagues, that have a research and development lab which would be quite essential in bringing things uh, forward. We're quite um, um, uh, conservative, uh, I would say, in our, in our way of thinking and uh, the way we work. So cut a long story short, uh, we sat down with a number of uh, uh, corporations, security experts, etc., and together with our local partners. And in 2013, in April, we launched what we call the Natalia Project. This is the world's first assault alarm system for human rights defenders at risk, powered by social media. Uh, this is a bracelet. This is the technique. It's basically a mobile phone. It's a commercial product that we uh, uh, took a closer look to, and uh, with our security experts and with our knowledge, we tweaked it uh, in different ways uh, to have it not to work counterproductive uh, uh, in, in our protection of human rights defenders on the ground. Uh, when the alarm is triggered, a uh, distress signal is sent out to five people in the close proximity of the person who is under attack. Uh, signal is also coming out to Civil Rights Defenders Head Office in Stockholm. And we can push the, the news out in social media just within a couple of minutes uh, after an attack. Um, I think that this is, uh, besides the life-saving potential of this, this has actually become uh, one of the world's, or if not the world's most uh, awarded digital campaign in uh, in the last year. Uh, I think it's quite easy. Uh, everyone can get involved. Uh, either you contribute with your uh, financial resources, you can come up with ideas, you can become part of the security network by adding yourself to uh, uh, social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Uh, and be part of the reaction network when, when someone is put under attack. I think that Human rights organizations need to uh, find solutions like, like, like this. And we will continue to do that in our uh, R&D lab that we have uh, now set together in developing the Natalia project further, but also to find other solutions on how to make the lives of our brave people out there uh, even more secure. 
It's quite popular nowadays to talk about development financing, having companies and governments coming together with in supporting uh, CSO, civil society organizations around the world in achieving uh, things together. I think we ne need also to talk about development innovation, to think outside the famous box and to get together and find the solutions that we are, uh, that we are so desperately uh, wanting. Uh, and I think that uh, an event like this is really a perfect opportunity to uh, get together with a number of stakeholders to discuss this issue further, and I look forward to participating in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Next up on the docket, we have uh, Eva Bloom Dumonte, who is an advocacy officer at Privacy International. Welcome. Hi, thanks, Julia. I'm really glad to be here, not just because I almost missed my turn, but um, actually because the core of my work at Privacy International uh, is to do investigations in the so-called global south. So for me, what the global south means is actually countries in North Africa, in South America, and in Thailand. And by virtue of working in those countries, I've become sort of ex extremely reliant on companies. And that's why this sort of talk between, you know, discussing the synergies between, uh, between those two is so important because, you know, you can't file an FY request in Thailand. You can't go to the Egyptian government and be like, hey, this is totally not cool the way you're not respecting the privacy of your citizen, you should, you know, you should stop that. No, you can't do that. So basically what, uh, what makes me so reliant is that, for example, when you have a company like Vodafone that in last June uh, published, um, published a transparency report on, um, on, you know, on the practices in their country, that's, that was invaluable to us, to my work as an investigator. I would have never been able otherwise to understand sort of so clearly how telecommunications are being intercepted in Egypt. Now, the other thing as well that uh, that could, you know, that I keep thinking of when I think of, you know, companies like telcos, like Google, like Twitter, is the sort of the pool of data that they rely, they probably sitting on, and that they would probably not mind sharing with civil society. And what I think by that is, to give you an example, I've been, I've been asking lately uh, people you know, in the country uh, to run command lines on the terminal to find out if Star TLS was disabled in the country. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's fine. That's basically a form of encryption that can be disabled. And well, it sort of tells you a lot about surveillance in those countries when you find out about it. And you know, I didn't know about it myself until like a tech guy told me, oh, you should probably do that. And I'm thinking those people are sitting on a pool of data that could also, again, be invaluable to us in understanding how surveillance work. And you know, that's sort of something that I would like to advocate with other NGOs working in this sector. How can we sort of engage uh, companies in like thinking about the data they have, like, you know, is HTTPS disabled in, you know, Egypt? Is your website being redirected in Thailand? Those kind of data that can tell you a lot. Now, another fight that I think you know we should um, that I think we should uh, fight for <laughs> should be would be the, again the transparency of uh, of those companies. Like I think, sort of two examples that illustrate what I mean would be one on the one hand, Turkey and Twitter. I mean, we knew that the Turkish uh, that the Turkish government wanted to wanted to censor Twitter. We know that Twitter refused and was banned. You know, we, we could follow the story because the whole thing was fairly transparent. Now, again, as I said, with the program I work on for that's actually funded by CEDA, I um, in Thailand I've like come across like cases of people who've been jailed for les majesté. Les majesté basically means like you can go to jail like whatever you say about the king, like he co he, in, even if it's not sort of like strong criticism. In the one case I have in mind, all he said was like posting a, a post on a forum saying, oh, the king is very sick. That was the whole thing. And, um, and so the guy was, I mean, sent to jail. And what was the main evidence in his, in his, during his trial was that was um, data that had been handed over by Microsoft. And, you know, 
I understand this. This is, you know, this, they are legally obliged to do this. They have an office in Bangkok, which means they have to comply with Tylo. And no matter how ridiculous Tylo is, they have to comply to it. Now, you know, I just think, you know, if someone in the office of Microsoft in the US had posted a, you know, a report or a blog post or anything saying, hey, so this is what the government, the Thai government is asking us, and we have to do this because we're legally obliged to do this, but we're not okay with it. We, you know, we don't agree. We don't, we think it's wrong. Had they been doing that, I think that the Thai government would actually think about it twice before asking Western companies for the data. And, you know, the last thing, the last thing that I would like to sort of discuss all again with other NGOs, with telcos companies who are here, is, you know, who is our point of contact in those companies? And, you know, the same way all the, this company, the telcos, have like a press person in their office, you know, why can't they be like, you know, an NGO person? And, what I mean by that, and I think you know every every single NGO is going to have their their case, but you know, for example, for us, what it means is that I have people who call me like again in Thailand. That was the case of a, uh, someone I had, you know, one of my sources in Thailand called me, and he's like, "Hey, Eva, one um, one of my friend had disabled his Facebook account. Now he's just been sent. To, he's just been arrested and sent to jail." And his account has just been reopened. So I know it's actually the police logging into his account to sort of like sniff all the data he's going to be able to find to see, you know, who he's talking to, what people are saying. And he's like, you need to do something right now. And, you know, it's normal for him. Like, I'm, you know, I'm the girl working on surveillance in London. So, of course, he would be calling me. What do I say to him? Oh, you have to report the account and maybe in a week or so the account will be disabled? No, you can't, you can't do that. So, so far what I've been doing is, in a way, I've been lucky enough to sort of have a friend at Google, have a friend at Facebook. So I just call my friends and I'm like, hey, I'm in big shit. I have this activist telling me so and so, can you help me? But, you know, like most, you know, NGOs can't rely on like one of their employees having a friend there or a friend here. Like we need to have an actual sort of point of contacts in those companies that know the demands of NGOs, that, you know, know what they want, that can answer the questions. And, you know, I think this is how we'll be able to start a, a good dialogue with them. Thank you. No. Keep the mic on. Uh, next, we welcome up uh, Henrik Toremark, who is in charge of public affairs at MTG. Thank you. Um, probably a lot of you know about MTG if you are from Sweden. Perhaps you think about us as a provider of great entertainment, sports, that we broadcasted the Olympic Games, which we were, of course, very proud of. But uh, we are also a global broadcaster with operations in 40 countries, span six continents, and uh, unlike, unlike in Scandinavia, in large part of Europe, we are the leading um, news provider of news and views. Um, came yesterday from the Czech Republic, which is one example, uh, in the Baltics, in Bulgaria, uh, and also we have operations in Africa. Um, and that is, of course, that news coverage play an even more important role in promoting freedom of expression in many of these countries, often with a, a, a weak tradition for this, or it is in fact not established. Um, so, um, by that we push freedom of expression, uh, and we often serve as a counterbalance to the public broadcasters, because in many countries the public broadcaster is not like here, very independent or completely independent from political influence. Um, but uh, so, therefore, we can um, offer alternative to a often polarized news reporting. And I would like to take the opportunity to say this, that we find it in working in new markets and countries that it is of a great advantage to us being being and seen as a Swedish company, because it's the, the brand Sweden is, is, is 
linked to transparency and we are seen as, as reliable. Freedom of expression is of course fundamental for all media, us included. Throughout our history, uh, we have continuously promoted freedom of expression by challenges, monopolies, expanding into new markets, uh, offering new platforms, technologies uh, and services, and also by offering a wide range of third-party channels uh, that, that so, so thereby promoting plurality. This is, as we all know, a fundamental human right, and we want all consumers to have the right to choose program content from different media providers. Uh, and we, as a provider, we have a responsibility to make sure that there is journalistic integrity uh, so that people can build their own opinions and connect. But these words are easy to say, but it's not so simple in reality. Uh, for example, in Af Africa, we broadcast news on our free TV channels in Ghana and Tanzania. And um, we have to have the guts to, to have news coverage of things that are uh, sometimes uh, regarded as, as not, uh, um, uh, how to say, that, that other media don't want to cover. It can be gender violence, violence toward children, uh, and harassment by the police. Uh, and, and so in our TV1 news there in Tanzania, we try to report co continuously, cover, cover some of these topics. And in that work, we of course work closely together with other organizations to have their assistance, Human Rights Center, UNICEF, Save the Children, etc. Uh, we also face challenges for freedom expressions in terms of journalists uh, being assaulted, sometimes physically, because they refuse to report on certain issues or, uh, or that they or being tried to, to report on, on, uh, in a, f a favorable way of, of certain politicians, for example. And then, then again, it is of importance for us, being I international Swedish company, to, to, st to st stand up against that. So there are challenges. It is important being able to distribute channels to, to broadcast, to have news coverage, and to distribute other channels and to develop, develop new platforms. I should also end by saying that, that we also sometimes face uh, challenges for freedom of expression in, in Europe. We know that in, even in some EU countries there have been discuss discussions on different restrictions and so on. Therefore, it is of importance within the European Union that we stand up for the values and the principles that are guiding the, the media policies, meaning that if you broadcast a channel in one EU country, you should be able to access that also in other EU countries. I think this principle is very is a, is an important step long, to have a long-term and strong protection for uh, freedom of expression. Um, the principles should be fundamental um, for all me media and broadcasting. Broadcasting, We stand up for our joint, joint principles and defending human rights together. We hope as an industry being able to contribute with our experiences, but this opportunity and others are extremely important to get your input and how we can work stronger together. Thank you very much for attention. And finally, we welcome up Per Nordlund, Lead Specialist of Democracy and Human Rights at SIDA. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And again, on behalf of SIDA, it's fantastic to see so many of you in this room. And the engagement and response that we have received to, to this development talk. And it really gives us energy and in incentives to move ahead strongly in this field. Uh, 
many of you have traveled far to participate in this development talk and we have representatives in the room from civil society, from government, from business and from academia. But at the same time today, as we are meeting here, there are other events ongoing discussing the same issues. In Islamabad, Pakistan, the Dig Digital Rights Foundation is hosting a national conference on privacy rights. And in Lusaka, Zambia, where I spent a lot of time, the Ubuntu Net Alliance is gathering their partners for a discussion on infrastructure, innovation and inclusion. This makes it very clear that we are many stakeholders involved in this uh, engagement in promoting human rights and, and ICT. I think it's also important that we in this process see constructive cooperation and mutual trust and accountability. For doing this, for achieving this, I think it's important that we also communicate our values in this. And as representing CEDA, I would like to do that here today. Uh, our main objective of Swedish aid is to contribute towards better living conditions for people living in poverty and under oppression. This is very important. The objective derives from a multidimensional view of poverty in which people are seen as actors capable of influencing their own futures. Empowerment happens when individuals and organized groups are able to imagine their world differently and to realize that vision by changing the relations of power that have been keeping them in poverty. Access to ICT is central to improving poor people's ability to shape their own visions of the future and for exercising their freedoms of speech and freedom of information. There are many examples of how people lift themselves out of poverty and where access to and use of ICT has been a contributing factor. Sweden supports a number of efforts, national, regional and global levels, and many of our partners are here today. Uh, we have a particular focus on increasing the use of ICT by women and other groups that are currently not fully participating in the information society. For SIDA, often working in very challenging political environments, we have an obligation to use our position to strengthen the voices of those who need it the most. We see ourselves as part of a global discussion and aim to promote a multi-stakeholder approach to ICT and human rights. One example is the African Declaration on Internet Rights and Freedoms, where our partners have been very successful in bringing concerned communities together in formulating relevant ICT policies and guidelines for the African context. The clear position now sanctioned through UN resolutions and cited here today many times already, the same rights that people have offline must apply online, is very inspiring and to all of us in this room as well. As at, at the same time, we repeatedly see how internet rights and freedoms are being cut back in many of the countries where we work, including countries that are coming out of conflict and are moving from peace building to state building. Internet has become an integral part of the fight against oppression all over the world. And we therefore seek to strengthen individuals and groups and institutions to use the internet to assert their fundamental rights and freedoms. In particular, we want to further strengthen poor people's access to ICT and their capabilities of using ICT for their own empowerment. For example, by increasing the participation of women in politics through ICT and for the employment of women in the IT service sectors. By offering a clear alternative with democracy and human rights as fundamental and normative principles, Sweden and other like-minded states must continue to influence the global debate on access, freedom, human rights and security on the internet in a positive direction. Development cooperation has a key role to play in this. And the same is true for ICT companies, including their business partners, suppliers and investors. Sweden's policy for global development clearly states that aid is not the government's only tool for reducing poverty and increased freedom, uh, equitable and sustainable development. Through the government's focus on coherence between different policy areas, such as aid and trade, 
or government expects Swedish ICT companies to respect human rights. We encourage Swedish companies to make use of internationally recognized standards for sustainable business practices, already mentioned, uh, UN uh, guiding principles for business and human rights. And this is particularly important when Swedish companies are working in difficult political environments. It is th still the responsibility of governments to ensure respect for human rights. But companies in the telecom industry have an obligation to follow the law in the countries where they operate, and they also have a moral, moral responsibility to ensure that their actions do not undermine or conflict with the respect for human rights, such as freedom of expression or the right to privacy. The companies and the industry itself must therefore pursue sustainable business practices and corporate social responsibility uh, by upholding non-corrupt practices and human rights principles, including the rights of workers. Sweden also encouraged the creation of voluntary guidelines worked out in dialogue with stakeholders. And I think that the transparency reporting that we now increasingly see among telecom companies is an interesting example of this. It's not the full picture, but it's a step in the right direction. So Sweden has taken the initiative to work with businesses to promote greater freedom on the internet. At CEDA we worked actively, as, our, as Charlotte, our Director General, said, with the Swedish Leadership for Sustainable Development Network, which is a network of 20 plus Swedish companies. Uh, the goal is that Sweden and CEDA will be a leader in efforts to engage with companies and to facilitate solutions to problems that arise in markets where respect for human rights are not upheld. We all have a role to play to ensure that ICT and human rights can be mutually supportive. And we look forward to a constructive engagement with you and other stakeholders in this development walk ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So I will open up with a very um, a very broad question, because sometimes it can be good to sort of take things to their extreme. Uh, if you think about the worst case scenario, uh, I don't need you to describe it specifically because I think we all have a good imagination, but what do you think can be, uh, this is for the whole panel, what decisions can we make, we as uh, organizations or policy decisions that could make things go as wrong as possible? Eva, you look like you have a thought. No, 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 not yet. I'm still... <laughs> but... You know, one of the points I mentioned was, uh, was the point of transparency. And I think w one of the key things when you, when you think of, like, worst-case scenario for... Um, I mean, for us, like, as NGOs workers who work with, you know, with people you know, actually being able to, to say things, to advocate, to say this is what's going on in such country, we are facing this and that, and and having companies actually doing the same, uh, it's, you know, I would say lack of transparency is the best way for things to worsen. I think one of, the, one of the challenges in the ICT sector is that we all know the threats and we all know the consequences, but with technology, you can't see it. It's not, you know, it's can often not be physical. It's not like with you know the torture trade or the arms trade. There's something physical to latch onto. With a lot of the technology, you can't see. The surveillance equipment is hidden. So, you know, trying to connect the threats from ICT to real-world physical harm can sometimes be quite difficult for people to get their heads around. So I'm so interested in your, you know, civil rights defenders have a physical, you know, something to really kind of hang hang it on say well you know someone's wearing that there there is obviously a threat that's been designed to protect somebody for a threat it's kind of connecting the technology the threat and the resolution all in one but my question to you actually about your bracelet is how many alarm calls do you get in a year or a month and also can you give us an example of how it's maybe saved somebody actually um, i uh, was quite an interesting conversation i had uh, when we launched the uh, the alarm uh, about a year ago uh, with Ioana sanchez one of the bloggers one of the most yes. famous bloggers on, on cuba she uh, came to sweden and uh, we had a discussion and i introduced her to the uh, natalia project and uh, i mean 
uh, take a country like like Cuba, it's about a thousand arrests every month of human rights defenders. So the day before she came to Sweden, uh, a friend of her, uh, living alone in his apartment, was uh, uh, taken by the police and brought to the police station. And it was quite interesting. It sort of we looked at each other and just sort of came to the conclusion: well, if this guy would have been a part of the Natalia project. Uh, the alarm would have set off. She would have get a, the alarm signal together with the GPS signal, so she would have seen where he is. Uh, we have, we would have received the signal in Stockholm. We have a very active uh, embassy in Havana, so we will call the ambassador to say that X is now uh, being taken by the police, and we can see him being brought to this and this police station. So at least theoretically, within a couple of minutes, I mean, the ambassador could actually be able to call the, uh, uh, the, the, the police station before he, the guy even arrives there. Uh, and actually the, know, uh, the world would know about it. While in the, the, the real case, it took at least uh, a half a day before people actually knew where, where he was. Mm -hmm. So that's a very practical uh, example. Unfortunately, and, and sometimes people get a bit uh, disappointed when I tell this, we haven't had a, 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 a full alarm yet. We have had some false alarms. Uh, we had a case of uh, Rasul Yafarov in Azerbaijan. Uh, the Azeri uh, civil society has been really under attack uh, lately. And uh, uh, he was called by the police to come to the police station and he feared that he would be arrested. So he took the, the uh, bracelet on him and uh, called us to say that he was going to the police. Uh, they just questioned him and then he went back. A couple of days later, uh, he got the same phone call. The police calls and he goes there and thinks, well, you know, j they just questioned me the last time, so I don't bring the bracelet. Obviously, uh, mm -hmm. they took him. So, and he's now in, in prison uh, uh, waiting a trial. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, sort of, the, the, that's the kind of play, uh, situations that mm -hmm. we have. I remember Yuani from Cuba coming to Sweden at that she spoke at the Stockholm Internet yes. Forum a couple of years ago, and I've never heard anyone speak so eloquently about how lonely it is to mm. be a human rights yes. defender and, as, and how much pressure Yuani in particular is under every single day. And it seems like some these kind of tools are mm. something that makes human rights defenders feel a little less lonely. Well, um, how many I mean bracelets are there out? Uh, we, set a, we set a target on 55 bracelets, and I, I will explain in a while, uh, because people say, well, just give out the, the bracelets, how difficult can it be? First of all, I mean, the, the technique is not that uh, expensive, uh, but it, it comes with a lot of uh, other stuff. First of all, we set up individual security protocols for each and every one, so every, every person's si uh, specific situation uh, differs from, from each other. So that is done. Uh, we have the training of the person in question in, in both digital and physical security. We have training of uh, the what we call the shields, the people uh, in the close proximity that work together with the person and who are the first ones to, to react if something happens. And then we uh, also set up uh, the alarms. And of course, there's a question of, of uh, resources. Uh, we will almost reached the target for, for this year. And we're now continuing in our lab to develop, uh, uh, this is just one of the examples that we have. This is just the technique. We have the, we call it the alarm system because it's, uh, this is the commercial product, but then we have uh, Twitter, Facebook, all the, 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 the global security network that could respond to, a, to an attack. Uh, and we're also working on a concealed version uh, for, for specific cases and, and other stuff and uh, also a light version to have uh, sort of uh, national networks instead of uh, international. So it's a lot of things going on. But I think that what is most important is to see that, well, you know, of course you could take the technique, and technique is, is great, it's really lovely, but you need to connect it to the people. Uh, otherwise, you, you will, you're bound to fail. And, and this is really what it's all about. Henrik, you, uh, as, as sort of the, the business side of it, because we talk often about corporate responsibility, and then we forget that businesses often feel that they have the say, they have a responsibility to their shareholders. Mm -hmm. How do you explain and balance that? Because you know businesses are about making money. How do you explain that to? Um, I think that is is uh, quite easy to understand because uh, these issues, especially in our new markets, are, are very strong rooted in, in our comp company, but. 
uh, let me then, uh, before continuing uh, on some challenges here, um, of course, I'm, I'm commenting this with, with great humility if you're talk, talking about worst case um, uh, scenario, but, but we all have to, uh, in our different roles, try to contribute to, to, to uh, prevent. And if you're talking uh, about um, ICTs, for example, I, I think that, that we, I mean, in general, I think we must uh, be clear that, that these developments, the technology, uh, uh, is positive from, from a freedom of expression and human rights pers perspective. We know we have had problems with the Arab Spring and so on, and therefore it is important that there are established and, and uh, credible distributors of news and information so that you, you, you and that they can work and and get this information out um, so I, and there there are a lot of things we we can do uh, and we see every day the new, new possibilities to to reach out and how hard will you push back how hard will you how do you find the balance between being able to stay in a country to provide the news and uh, following the rules and guidelines? I mean, we, we have very strong internal uh, um, codes uh, of conduct and how to work. Uh, it will be um, too long to, to, to take them in, into details, but I mean, we, we if we talk, just to give you one example, we have uh, very, um, uh, we have preventive mechanisms like uh, strong anti-bribery, and corruption practices for, for, for individual journalists, which of obviously is important. And also we have sort of uh, re reactionary mechanism if something happens and so on. But, but then of course there are always, uh, at the end of the day is, is of course, is it possible for us to work in, in, in this country and, 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 and provide our services? And that, that is based on, on our freedom of <laughs> expression policies, of course. So. And, and when will you make the call to, to, if you can make money by staying or, or leave, uh, to make a stance? What will the choice I mean, be? Uh, we, I think we must, we must uh, perhaps explain a little bit about who we are. Because it's, it's if, if, we, if we are running, uh, which is not the case in Sweden, for example, if we are running a, a news channel, then we have very, very clear uh, uh, policies and principles. We, we wouldn't compromise in any way. Uh, then there is another thing, if we're distributing channels and so on, that, but that's not our own, and, and you can, you can, uh, there can, can be some limitations, of course, in, in, in some countries. Uh, but but when it comes to our own business, we, we, we must be able to work in accordance with, with, with this, uh, with the freedom of expressions and our, our own pri principle, and that is absolutely central. Robert. Well, getting, back to your, uh, getting back to your original question, I mean, the worst kind of decision, I, I think that you know, uh, if we sit in our chambers and just say that, well, you know, we will find all the solutions within our own, own structures, then we're really in deep trouble. I think that we all need to, I'm being self-critical, I, uh, I said earlier that uh, we're quite conservative business in the human rights uh, sphere. And, uh, you know, we quite often say that, well, you know, everyone needs to chip in if we want to achieve a change in, in the world. But when companies, for instance, come to us and say, well, you know, what can we do? And say, oh, no, 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 not companies. Uh, you're, you're the bad guys. So we need to let go of that and, and, and you know, uh, start working together in, in trying to uh, actually achieve something while maintain, maintaining your integrity. I, I, I think it's, it's quite possible. And uh, I think that... Taking our own example, working with H and M, for instance, uh, of course, one could discuss, uh, you know, what are H and M doing in Ethiopia. I think that they are doing a great job, uh, uh, having a contact uh, with the regime. It's difficult; uh, they will run into to problems. But the question is, how do they deal with them, uh, and and how, you know, what are their intentions and ambitions in in, in increasing their presence? And I say, that, well, in, in, um, in Cambodia, for instance, when we are working with, uh, with uh, improving the situation in, in Cambodia, uh, we haven't had 
the same kind of opportunities as we have today to influence the Cambodian government on improving the human rights situation as we have now through uh, H&M, who represents you know, a majority of the, the exports uh, in the country. So of course, there are sort of, you have to be constructive in, in finding the ways for the, uh, to achieving the, the ultimate uh, objectives. Bye. Strange to talk about the worst case scenario, but but I think I mean we at CETA we worked for 50 years in difficult environments and and look we we recognize that this is not easy this is difficult this is difficult terrain to to navigate I think from my perspective one of the great strength of the ICT and the internet revolution has been this collaborative this multi stakeholder this organic approach to develop these. Um, rules and norms of, of, of how to use ICT for good. And yes, there are big and powerful nations involved that want to see a fragmentation, that wants to see a breakup of this process. And uh, to me, th that, is, that is a serious threat. I think to, to be able to make, like, Ro like Robert is saying, unless we can continue this process together, I mean, it, it's. And, and I really meant when I said there has to be sort of mutual trust and accountability in this process. I think that's the only way for We can't solve this only by legislation and institutions. There has to be more that keeps this process together. And in order to achieve that, I think we all need to make the extra effort of meeting and understanding the other partners involved. But we also have to stand up very firmly for the norms and, and, and values that I talked about in the beginning. This is about rights, this is about freedom, uh, and we have to be very clear about that. Eva, you talked about access to, to data um, that can be released. How do you find the balance? Because oftentimes data can be both helpful, helpful and harmful depending on who gets access to it. So how do you find that balance between openness and, and safety? No, and I, I'm glad you asked because obviously I work specifically on the... Uh, Thank you. On the right to, to privacy and uh, and surveillance. So, for example, I'm the first one to not to advocate for like destroying da personal data and and actually keeping as little data as possible. What uh, what I meant when I was talking about data, I was uh, I was specifically referring to um, you know to, to technical technical data, not not obviously uh, user data, personal data. I would say, you know, one of the mm, one example that comes to mind is like, you know, has the tra traffic suddenly dropped? Being able to analyze that the traffic has dropped doesn't mean you keep any data on your user. Like, you know, for example, Tor, the uh, anonymous browsing, uh, um, is able to provide such uh, actually such data, and they they are obviously very and entirely anonymous. But actually, I just want to jump on that on this question and. I was, well, because we have a concrete example with the Natalia project. Like, how did you deal with sort of the, the threat, the risk that uh, maybe, you know, a government, well, obviously a government, I would say, uh, could, you know, maybe try and hack uh, the GPS function of the Natalia project and actually use it as a surveillance tool? Absolutely. Now, I mean, first of all, we, we need to know that, uh, I mean, in any event, they are better off with this than to start with. Because now they basically have mobile phones, uh, which they use without any security uh, in mind at all, normally. Uh, but what we did was to uh, encrypt it, uh, uh, quite extensively so, and uh, also make it in what we call a stealth mode. Uh, so it's invisible. So it's it, it instead of, uh, as the commercial product is, uh, you could actually track it, which it would be very counterproductive from our perspective. Yeah. So we made it a stealth mode. So it's only uh, starts to work when you trigger the alarm. So that those are the kinds of uh, things that we. Uh, okay. yeah. So when we're talking about specific technologies, because it's very easy to talk about ICT as this very sort of broad, what technologies do you think are um, at the forefront right now? What are you focused on? Are we talking about cell phones? Are we talking about social media? Because again, it's this huge. Um, Lucy, for instance, what do you think? needs to be worked on more or what is in the forefront right now um in terms of you know tools like social media or, or cell phones i think the the thing across the board is encryption i think you know strong encryption is incredibly important for everyone not just people who are at risk but you know 
the thing about the ICT sector is when you're trying to identify um, impacted users or uh, impacted stakeholders, potentially we all are because we all use these tools and we are at risk, you know, not just for human rights defenders that, um, that you deal with, but also, you know, cybercrime, um, you know, we do so much online that encryption helps all of us. So what we're hearing about, you know, certain parties trying to weaken encryption or um, to try and circumvent it, this is something that everyone needs to realise that encryption is incredibly important for the future of ICTs and the trust of ICTs and companies. I, I, sorry, no, please. Eva, no, go I ahead. I was going to say, well, obviously, I mean, Privacy International is not sort of a, you know, a security, uh, security training organisation, but one of the, one of the tips that we give often is to actually, is to, first of all, like threat modelling, understand, you know, who you want to protect your data from. If you want to protect your data from the NSA or GCHQ, well, chances are you won't. Uh, now, if your government is not, you know, you know the US or the UK, uh, there is a number of steps you can take. But you won't, you know, encryption is one thing. You won't be able to encrypt everything. You won't be able to protect everything. So understanding what is actually the data you want to protect and what are the steps you're ready to make to protect those data is actually, I think it's the best, like, sort of advice you can give. Um, yeah, because whatever whatever might be sort of the most uh, you know the m data you most want to protect, uh, maybe actually not being on the internet at all is probably the best way to protect it. <laughs> so the the most the best thing about ICT is staying far far away. <laughs> <laughs> the, and th that's the thing. Obviously, you can't stay away for all your data. So th that's that's why we take the extra step of like of you know of saying you know understand what are the data you really want to protect. Uh, just short. Um, I, I think that it's it's quite easy to focus on you know the really difficult uh, issues, but I mean l with uh, with regards to the Natalia project, we're facing uh, some of the most sophisticated security services in the world. I mean, if they want to hack the the, the bracelet or you know if they want to kill a, a person, they they do it, and there's not much we can do about it. Uh, but I think that uh, most often we we lose track on the simple things, both in life but also in security. Uh, that you know, uh, ordinary email, day-to-day uh, -day communication. That all of a sudden you have uh, international human rights organisations conversation, uh, having conversations with people on the ground who are uh, running a great risk, and you're having quite detailed information about w their whereabouts and what they're doing and, and the contacts, etc. And people just don't think about it and, ha and how much they put other people in, in danger. And, and especially when it comes to something uh, of an emergency case, it's really easy to think about speed instead of security. And then you go uh, turn to ordinary email, for instance. So, so sort of everyday encryption as Absolutely. well. Bye. I want to take it a little bit different approach to it. I think th these are really interesting. And, and crucial aspects of this, but for, for us it's also the first step of actually making sure that people have access to this. Uh, and we know the effect that that can have. For example, if you know the, the price on the market for your products uh, in a rural setting, it's so much easier for you to, to actually make a decent profit of this and be able to change your, your, your life accordingly. So for us that, that, that is really very important, but it's more than that. It's more than the access. It's the capability of using that for empowerment and for inclusion that we need to work with. And that, that has to do with how you do education, yeah, whether people are healthy enough to, to be able to use this technology. So, so this is really important, but for us at CEDA as well, I mean, we, we we support this, but we also support the other aspects of bringing this closer. And here the telecom industry is really important yeah. for, for the access uh, part. A question there, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, our own experience when it comes to this access to information media has been very much uh, information, education and, and, and how to strengthen for example, children as media consumers and so on. And, and media in itself is a p very powerful tool for education. And we, we try to engage in, in Africa in different co projects to cooperate uh, in this. And that, that is, of course, important. Uh, but how, how do you see uh, sort of the, the knowledge of, 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 of uh, 
ordinary people to, to be aware of risks and so on, and how to counter. Oh, that, that's a challenging question. Um, I, think, I think the risks are there, but I think for many people, the first aspect is to get access and then be able to know how to use this. Then there are all the complicating issues that we've been raising, in especially in, in, in uh, politically closed societies where we work. And we know, I mean, if, if we look at the development of democracy around the world, yes, there has been tremendous progress, but over the last 10 years, more, more countries are showing a negative than a positive uh, development. So in, in increasingly, we work in environments where countries are not democracies, but they're not outright autocracies either. The cost, partly because of ICT, the cost of upholding a, a really authoritarian society is too high today. But you can do it, you can do it, you can still do it by subtle means, like you say, invisible. It's hard, it's hard to pinpoint, but it's there, it happens. And there we need the help of our partners to, 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 to deal with some of these issues. But there is no other way. You, you have to engage with it, both in terms of access and capabilities, but also in terms of the security and privacy matters that we talked about. And But as you say also, and uh, Henrik touched on this as, as well in the beginning, that there are also countries that we would all consider democracies and free countries where there are also a lot of restrictions placed and there are um, maybe a lot of threats to human rights and free and, and open conversations and ICT. Do we, is there a risk that we forget to do the same kind of work here uh, if we focus on, on countries where the threats are the most open? Lucy, for instance, what would you say? Um, I think, I mean, just go to go back to Per's point about, you know, access, education, and, you know, they're important. I think security really goes alongside that as well. You know, access, education, security, edu security, education is important. I think we need to th think about all three at the same time. And if you think about a country like Myanmar, which is just starting to open up, the ICT sector is pretty much being built from scratch. Um, the laws haven't quite been established that have kept up with its development. And, you know, because they are developing so quickly, it's very important that everything kind of develops together. Um, sorry, what was the... <laughs> that was no, the I was thinking if we think about countries in the EU, for instance, mm. that we would think of as open democracies, is there a risk that things will happen here that we will miss because we think of ourselves as free and open? Uh, Are there threats to, to human rights and openness here? Robert? Well, I think that uh, I usually say that uh, uh, Sweden are... are often labeling themselves as, as ch world champions in, in human rights. Uh, and we love to talk about human rights <laughs> elsewhere, uh, but not in Sweden. <laughs> uh, but I think this is an excellent area to actually uh, both start working more on, but also to highlight. And that is, for instance, Swedish, uh, Sweden's role in, uh, in the global surveillance network uh, with assisting NSA, etc., through the uh, FRA uh, log and, and, and the, 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 the uh, different the hub that Sweden are in the, in the network. Uh, but it takes resources, and a lot of resources are being, as I said, you know, focused on, on, on elsewhere, but not in Sweden. And this, the civil society that we also brag about are, to a very large extent, focused on elsewhere and not on Sweden. So we lack, uh, well, I, uh, sorry for bragging, but I think that we are, the civil rights defenders are perhaps the prime watchdog when it comes to, to, to human rights issues in Sweden. But, I mean, we don't have... Far, you know, far enough of resources. I always say, well, I could have 10, 15 uh, lawyers just working on Sweden without a problem, and we would make hell of a noise, but, uh, yeah. Eva? Actually, yeah, I think it's funny because you would be asking that because when I, I tell people that I work on, you know, surveillance and privacy, actually, the, you know, the usual reaction is like, oh, do you work on, like, the yeah, NSA revelation? Do you work, you know, in, like, privacy on, like, European and American issues? And when you tell people, no, actually, I work in, like, North Africa or South America, and, like, the idea that people are also entitled to their privacy is actually something um, that sometimes <laughs> surprises people. But, um, so, yeah, I obviously, on the topic of surveillance, I mean, there, there is a huge, I mean, U Europeans and Americans are the ones who, I mean, with governments who have the most capabilities. The fact that, you know, that we don't end up in, 
is in jail or being tortured every week doesn't mean that this is not a problem that needs to be addressed. So I think that's, you know, it's also great to be working with, uh, uh, to be discussing that with CEDA, for example, you know, to say, well, sure, we, we are working in the global self advocating, but what can you do to make sure your, gov your governments uh, will defend those rights in, uh, um, you know, in Europe as well? Can I get you? No, no I, I'm just coming back to what I, what I said before. There, 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 we, we, there has been um, m many examples also in Europe over the years. Um, the most uh, attention, I would guess, has, has been uh, in Hungary with the media laws and try to, to uh, impose different restrictions. And therefore, I think it, it is, it is uh, of great importance that we, w that we st have common rules within the EU and that we should also, when it comes to the access of, to information and news, that, 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 that th these principles should be that, that you can really decide if you want a certain channel or receive a channel, and, and that, that principle is m must be protected and strengthened, I think, in the years to come. But there are obviously pressures from, from different EU countries to, 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 to get greater uh, enforcement policies on, 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 on to restrict the, the access to media. We're going to close out the discussion by asking, because uh, we're talking today about coming together from different parts of both business and NGOs, who should be brought into the discussion? If you could bring someone here on the stage right now with a wave of magic wand to either talk nicely to or attack, uh, who would you like to bring to the stage right now to bring to this discussion? Investors, I think, and uh, they're a really important part of the, the discussion and investors and companies to need to get involved more, I think, in the human rights discussion. Well, a person with a huge network, a lot of money, and a great technolo uh, technology knowledge. Sandstrom, perhaps. There was someone from Google who was supposed to be there and who cancelled. I think it would have been great to have him here. <laughs> I think there are al already a lot of very interesting people here, so I don't <laughs> want to, to ask someone else, but, uh, but I think it is it would be uh, great to, in another panel perhaps, to, to be able to discuss how can we cooperate better, for example, in, in, in Africa when it comes to education, media, and, and uh, with human rights organizations. And, and, and I'm very happy to listen to the others that will be here today and, and to, sh to share their wide experiences. Yes, I think this room is plenty. <laughs> uh, I, I think there's so much capacity here for us to move forward, but I think we also need to be mindful of the people who are not here, the, r the important countries that do not engage in this, the big corporations that I still have a lot of responsibility. We have Henrik, we have others represented in the room that are engaging with this, but there are still quite a few that are not engaging properly in this. So I think we need to be mindful of the difficult partners try to keep them inside the discussion so we don't see a fragmentation, so we don't see a polarization. I think that's a challenge. If we don't have any questions from the internet right now, uh, I would like to thank our panel, Lucy, Robert, Eva, do we? Yes, is there a microphone somewhere in the? Yes. Do I? Julia Lapitsky, Queen Little Queen Foundation, and I would like to bring another perspective. And uh, as we know, the internet is not more or less than the mirror of the society. And uh, there are more bad guys from the society than states and uh, companies that are collecting the data. And I would like to bring an example from Armenia, one of our partner organizations. They were um, faced by a vast campaign by the extreme nationalists on internet launching, like, you know, uh, publishing pictures, their details, when you see them on the streets, you know what you do. With the, their police failing to defend them in the little thing just to have some kind of help to them. So, uh, and I would claim that women are probably more vulnerable than that because it is very easy to say for the active women, well, it's not, it's probably not that they're being threatened, but also slandered, you know, launching these campaigns. But threats also is a big issue. So uh, what is your take on that? How do we deal with the states that fail to protect their um, citizens? 
And I would also bring some numbers. We had a, a very short uh, survey to uh, women human rights defenders in our network, and 55% of them are threatened through the internet. 14% of them are death threats. So it's just some numbers. Thank you. Um, actually, so your story is actually really interesting because it reminds me very closely of uh, my own investigation in Morocco. And I don't know if that's going to really give you any answer, but what we're doing is publishing a report early next year to actually address this issue. As when I started interviewing victims of surveillance in Morocco, open end to the regime, and I was expecting, you know, to find like stories directly related to the state. I know what they were, they, they were always talking about was like, you know, militia, little groups. And, you know, I'm trying to sort of dig and see, you know, maybe there are ties between, you know, the king and those small groups. But at the end of the day, what it is, is a bunch of youth who are extremely zealous, extremely patriotic, and who refuse to see any in their country, any opponents to the king, any opponents to the regime. And so, yeah, the, in a way, the government doesn't need to even make the extra miles of like, hacking and you know installing and bugging computers when actually you have a bunch of like quite skilled young hackers who are more than happy to sort of harass and and target uh, and target those activists so yeah i think this is and this is true the thing it's an issue that ha has absolutely not been discussed because you know we spent and you know probably rightfully so so much time addressing the issue of like invasion of privacy and surveillance coming from government and companies. But in some countries, and I guess Romania apparently is another example of that, we need to see the bigger picture and we need to probably appreciate that, you know, the bigger threat actually comes from parallel groups. I think that's Thank you. So we thank Lucy, Robert, Eva, Henrik and Per for their uh, panel, and I'm sure they will be around during the day if you want to ask them more questions. So let's thank them with a round of applause. <laughs> and we're going to have now what we in Sweden call a leg stretcher uh, for about seven or eight minutes. And please uh, don't leave the room because we all know that when you leave the room, it's gonna take you a long time to get back, settle down, so just get up, get blood flowing again, and we'll start again at half past.